and welcome to Fashion Through History, brought to you by English Heritage. I am fashion historian Dr. Serena Dyer, and today I'm here at Kenwood near Hampstead Heath in London. During the Georgian period, Kenwood was home to a number of individuals, including William Murray, the first Earl of Mansfield, and Dido Elizabeth Bell, who you might know from the film Bell. We'll be looking at some of the fashions that Dido Bell might have worn during her time at Kenwood, as well as those of her famous fashion contemporary, Georgiana Cavendish, Duchess of Devonshire. We'll be joined by Louise Cooling, English Heritage Curator, who'll be telling us a little bit more about life in Georgian society and Dido Bell and Georgiana Cavendish's places within it. How did Dido Bell come here to Kenwood? So Dido was born probably in around 1761, probably in the Caribbean. She was the daughter of a young enslaved African girl named Maria Bell and a Royal Naval officer, Captain Sir John Lindsay. We don't know a huge amount about Dido's early life, but we do know that when she was around five years old, her father brought Dido and her mother to England, and he placed five-year-old Dido into the care of his aunt and uncle, Lord and Lady Mansfield, here at Kenwood, to be raised alongside her cousin, Lady Elizabeth Murray, who was already here. Shanice is wearing our first look, which is based upon the famous portrait of Dido Bell and Elizabeth. So this gown is known as a sultana in the 18th century. It's based upon the exotic styles that were imported from places like Istanbul and Turkey. And women like Mary Wortley Montagu made them really popular. We see a lot of women wearing these styles of gowns in portraits from the 1740s onwards. But it's quite interesting that Elizabeth and Dido are presented in such a contrasting way in this painting, perhaps indicating the differences in their status and backgrounds. So can you tell us a little bit more about Dido Bell's relationship with her family? Yeah, absolutely. So. Dido was raised as a lady. She was very much part of the family, but perhaps a much loved, if poor, relation. So she was taught to read and write, play music. She also superintended the dairy here at Kenwood, which was a very fashionable pastime for aristocratic ladies in the 18th century. So, Shanice, shall we get you dressed into something a little more formal? Yes. <laughs> So let's start by taking off your sultana. Underneath your sultana, you're wearing a set of stays. Now these were a really important part of every 18th century woman's wardrobe. They are boned with something called baleen, which is whalebone, but it actually comes from the mouth of a whale and is a very flexible material. So they're not quite as uncomfortable as they might look. But they give this fabulous conical silhouette, which is really epitomizing that 18th century style. So the next garment we're going to put on you are these panniers. So you'll see that you're already wearing pockets. Mm -hmm. So this is where the Lucy Locket lost her pocket nursery rhyme comes from, because they're these tie-on pockets. And then over the top of those, you have even more storage space mm -hmm. in your panniers. So these are made from linen, and they are reinforced with cane strips that hold out this shape. So the next garment is your petticoat. So this just pops on over your head and dive into it. And then it ties at the front and then at the back. So you can see these slits on the side mean that you still have access to your pockets and your panniers underneath. So the next garment is your stomacher. So this pins onto the front of the stays. I 
And you could interchange the stomachers that you wore with different outfits. So you could have a matching stomacher, like this one. Or you could have a nice embroidered contrasting stomacher. And we even sometimes see dresses that have multiple matching stomachers made out of the same fabric, but with different trims on. So there's some variety without having lots of different dresses. And then finally, the gown. So the gown just slips on over the top. It has a fitted lining that fits to the body, but then has the beautiful flowing pleats at the back. And again, this just pins on. So that's the finished outfit. Is this something that you would normally wear, Shanice? Uh, not normally, but I do actually quite like it. I love the colour, it's beautiful. So yeah, maybe I'll start wearing it on a Saturday night. <laughs>had a chance to wear the dress Shanice can you tell us a little bit about how it feels yeah it feels pretty comfortable to wear I can imagine if you're wearing the stay every day that can be a bit uncomfortable but just for a few hours or for the day it's it's not too bad <laughs> And this was the quintessential dress of fashion when Dido Bell first came to Kenwood in the 1760s. This is known as a sackback and it's made from silk, which was a really popular choice in this period. So Louise, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how the Industrial Revolution influenced fashion in this period. The 18th century was a really dramatic time in British history. It saw Britain transformed into the first industrial superpower. This was the age of the Industrial Revolution where steam technology was changing, manufacturing was changing, and transport links were improving, all of which made Britain the first truly industrialized nation. So the dress that we have here is made up of three main parts. So we've got the gown, which opens at the front, and which is worn over a petticoat. So unlike today, where we think of a petticoat as being an undergarment, in the 18th century, it was something that was on show. And then the front, at the center front of the bodice is filled in with a stomacher. So this is just a triangular piece of fabric that's often covered with these elaborate decorations. We also have um, some excellent trim on this dress, which is really fluffy and gives that kind of 18th century aesthetic. And trim was another way that women stayed fashionable in the 18th century, because you could have this dress and change up the trim to different things. And here we can see the pinked trim on the dress. So pinking is this raw edge that's done in a decorative pattern, and it was achieved by using a metal stamp that was hammered along the fabric. You might see as well that this dress has a lot of fabric in it. The pleats at the back are massive. There's about 10 meters of fabric in this dress. But that means that it can be really easily reused and recycled into something else. And we actually see that Georgian fashion is surprisingly sustainable as garments are constantly reused because it's the fabric that's worth the money rather than the labor of making the dress. And shopping in this period was really driven by fashion leaders as well, like our next figure, Georgiana Cavendish. Our final look is modelled by Alice, who is wearing a gown very similar to those worn by Georgiana Cavendish, the Duchess of Devonshire, who was a fashion leader of the 18th century. Alice, how does the fabric of this gown feel? It's very light. Uh, it feels very, um, yeah, quite soft. The, the stays um, are a little bit more constricting, but mm. other than that, quite, quite free. Can you tell us a little bit more about Georgiana, Louise? Yeah, so Georgiana was one of the most charismatic figures of 18th century society. She was famous for her style, for her fabulous parties, and for being a bit of a media darling. And throughout Georgiana's life, there really was a huge amount of focus on how she looked. And the emphasis has really moved from the hips, which we saw with the last look, around to the bum. And the supportive undergarment is actually called a bum. 
We also see that the stomacher has disappeared and now we have a center front opening. And the hair has changed as well. Instead of just being about height, it's also about width and basically creating as large a headpiece as you can possibly get. The skirt on this dress can also allow for different options for how it can be worn. So again, we're seeing that versatility in fashion. You can unloop these cords at the back and have the skirt go full length. So can you tell us a little bit more, Louise, about Georgiana's life and times in London in the 18th century? Yeah, Georgiana was a woman of many interests and many talents. She was one of the first women to be actively involved in politics. So despite the fact that women wouldn't have the vote for more than a century, her husband's status meant that she could play an active part in politics and she was an keen advocate of the Whig party. She in fact took to the streets campaigning during one general election. She was also interested in science, she was interested in mineralogy and geology, and she had her own laboratory where she carried out chemical experiments. She wrote poetry, which some of which she had published, and a novel which was semi-autobiographical and was published anonymously in her own lifetime. Thank you so much, Louise and Alice. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. What we find inside the wardrobes of historical figures can tell us so much about the time in which they lived. And that's very much the case for Dido Bell and Georgiana Cavendish. If you would like to find out more about Dido Bell, Georgiana Cavendish or Kenwood, then please go to the English Heritage website.